Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons has been on stewardship, motives of the heart. Now this is lesson number 13 in that series, so we're going to try to wrap up here. This lesson is entitled, The Results of Stewardship. It's the lesson number thir 13 for March 31 of 2018. And as usual, we're going to ask you to, I hope you have your Bible handy, I ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is for us to rely on you, to ask you to guide us, and to turn to your word for the ways in which we can live better, happier, healthier lives. Be with us now as we discuss together and as we share with others who are watching around the world, may we say and do those things which you would honor and glory for as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the results of stewardship. Well, in this lesson, we're going to attempt to discover some of the benefits of being really true Christian stewards. So, is true stewardship going to impact us personally in what ways? Um, what are the... Hmm? Every way. Every way. That's the right answer. So what are the spiritual outcomes? If we are true stewards, how might that affect our lives uh, in, uh, as we live every day? Could it make our lives healthier and happier? Well, that's what God promises, isn't it? Um, we have options. We live in a world where we believe that we're free. But we, we can't isolate ourselves from the world around us. We are, we're in it. And especially in a populated area like Southern California, there's people everywhere. Uh, I've been some places that are worse, like uh, India, for example, but people are pretty crowded here anyway. So we have to constantly be aware of how they impact us and how we might impact them. Would, would being a good steward um, cause us to have a better impact on the people we associate with? Well, one of the key verses in this lesson is in Titus 2, 11 and 12. I'm going to just read that right now here. See if I can, I guess it's up to the full size here. For God has revealed his grace for the salvation of the whole human race. That grace instructs us to give up ungodly living and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this world. So, upright self-controlled, godly lives in this world. Do you think people would notice if we lived like that? Well, we can say one thing. Um, that's the way to heaven. There isn't any other way. If we don't have a relationship with God and we don't uh, live godly lives, we don't learn how to live godly lives, uh, we won't be there. Well, there are a lot of warnings in the Bible as well uh, uh, against living other kinds of lives. And uh, one of those, one of the most comprehensive and most serious warnings against that is found in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. And I think, Carrie, you have that. Yes. Remember that there will be difficult times in the last days. People will be selfish, greedy, boastful, and conceited. They will be insulting, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and irreligious. They will be unkind, merciless, slanderers, violent, and fierce. They will hate the good. They will be treacherous, reckless, and swollen with pride. They will love pleasure rather than God. They will hold to the outward form of our religion, but reject its real power. Keep away from such people. <laughs> Some of them will go into people's houses and gain control over weak women who are burdened by the guilt of their sins and driven by all kinds of desires. Women who are always trying to learn but who can never come to know the truth. As Janus and Jambres were opposed to Moses, so also these people are opposed to the truth. People whose minds do not function and who are failures in the faith. But they will not get very far, because everyone will see how stupid they are. 
That is just what happened to Janus and Jambres. That comes from the Good News translation of the Bible as per the American Bible Society. Okay. So, it's easy for us to say we should live godly, godlike lives, but uh, how many do you know, how many people do you know that do that? Is it more difficult, do you think, in our day, or was it more difficult back in Bible times? Um, well, we have some examples, don't we, in the Bible. Jesus, of course, is the perfect example. But what about people like Enoch and Noah and Job and Daniel? Were these people completely unusual and beyond our capacity to imitate? Or could some of us be Enoch's and Daniel's in our day? Well, think of everything that Job went through. I mean, man, <laughs> what an experience. But he remained faithful, and God said at the beginning that he would remain faithful, and he was, right? And I, I like the, you know, the story about how Job starts out, God says, this guy's going to be faithful, and Satan said, oh no, he's not going to be. And you remember the big argument? And I love the passage which comes up at the end of Job, Job 42, 7 and 8. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, that was one of Job's accusers, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as sacrifices for yourselves. Now I, every time I read that, I kind of wonder, you know, are they offering sacrifices to Job? But not really, I'm sure. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak to me, speak the truth about me as he did. What a, what a, what a testimony. Imagine. What does that have to do with stewardship? Well, we're, t we're talking about what kind of impact it would have on people's lives, and we're looking at the examples of some people who apparently live very sacred and holy and presumably good stewardship lives. I mean, Job is an example. If you remember, read in the middle of his book about chapter 29, somewhere in there, it says, when the widows came to me, I fed them. When the homeless came to, thee, I took, to me, I took care of them. Uh, I took care of everybody. I fed people, da-da-da. That's stewardship. Mm. Okay. I don't think you can argue with that. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Ezekiel 14, verse 14. Fred, I think that's yours. Uh, yes, oh. uh, taken from the Good News Bible also. Um, even those three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, who are living there. Their goodness would save them only, only their own lives. The Sovereign Lord has spoken. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Some of the critics of the Bible will tell you that the, the spelling of the word Daniel in this passage is slightly different. So they're going to say, no, this is not talking about the real Daniel that we know about. And so here's a comment that I'm going to ask Fred to read. Um, about in one of the one of the good solid commentaries about who this person might have been what the critics have said there's a ditch comment by the di block on ezekiel ezekiel 14 14 and the bible studies press 2006 says traditionally this has been understood as a reference to the biblical daniel though he was still quite young when ezekiel prophesied one uh, wonders if he had developed a reputation as an intercessor by this point. For this reason, some prefer to see a reference to a ruler named Daniel, known in Canaanite legend for his justice and wisdom. In this case, all three of the individuals named would be non-Israelites. However, D the Ugaritic Daniel is not known to have qualified uh, a faith in the Lord that would place him in the company of the other men. Yeah. So basically, I don't know how many of you lived in other countries in the world, but try to imagine a tiny little country that, say, someone came from that country, came to the United States when they were fairly young, and all of a sudden end up being uh, in the cabinet 
Well, people from that country would say, look, there's somebody from our country. So I don't have any problem at all with them saying Daniel was a great guy because he'd already saved all the, the, the lives of all the wise men by, you know, interpreting Daniel too. So I don't think there's any reason to question the fact that it was, it was really Daniel. But just for those of you who have critics around you who try to give other stories, that would be my answer. Well, look at Philippians 4, verse 11. And I am not saying this, this is Paul now, we're, we've jumped to the New Testament, and I am not saying this because I feel neglected, for I have learned to be satisfied with what I have. Now, what does that imply? Well, doesn't mean he had a cushy life. It does not mean he had a cushy life. Jeff, I think the next one is yours. That's mine. So we'll be reading from 2 Corinthians 11, verses 21 through 33, and this is taken from the Good News Bible. But if anyone dares to boast about something, I am talking like a fool, I will be just as daring. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they Christ's servants? I sound like a madman, but I am a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times, and I have been whipped much more, and I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers on the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil often. I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter, or clothing. And not to mention other things. Every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. Wow. And I might add, this was written before any of the shipwrecks or, or imprisonments or things that we, I, with the exception of that part of a night he spent in the Philippian prison, all of this happens before anything we know about from the rest of the Bible. I mean, you know, these, these whippings are supposed to take you within a hair's breadth of dying. And five times by the Jews and three times by the Romans. I mean, you know, and he says, but I don't worry about it. I'm content no matter what happens. Does that have anything to do with stewardship? I, can I make a comment? Sure. All right. I know I'm a newbie, but okay. <laughs> what I notice about Job, who was his wife? Yeah. What about those kids that died? Yeah. So people that are upright, how does it affect those that are around them. Mm -hmm. um, his friends who did not speak the, oh, and also Job spoke the truth about God. So all of you upright folks, have God bless your lips every day that we speak the truth about God every day to mm -hmm. people that we know and are around us. And the next thing I think about is that they took those off, they didn't, his friends didn't speak the truth about him. God was very displeased with the people that were around Job, and he had them take offerings and had Job pray for them. Mm -hmm. So ask God every day that he puts a burden on your heart for the people around you so that you pray for them, because nobody else is going to be doing it. Mm -hmm. well, now, when, when I studied, look at the book of Job, I think a lot about Job's wife, too. How many more kids did she have? Oh. <laughs> God bless her. <laughs> Another, what, there's seven more kids? Yeah. Oh. So is this, it, does this have to be, does this has to be about stewardship? The, well, stewardship of the I riches mean, do of you, His grace. Do you get whipped? Do you 
have to go out and get crashed in a shipwreck? Well, what is he's that? What, what, what stewardship's all about? Okay, we're, we're, we're a little bit later in this lesson, we're going to talk about witnessing, and that Paul well, was even Paul, witnessing. What does Paul, witnessing have to do with? That's what it. Okay, well, this is what it has to do with stewardship. If God has given you every blessing that you have, and He expects you to use it for His cause and for His work and for the benefit of your community and the benefit of your church and the benefit of God, then these people are examples of, this is an example of people who did that. Well, I thought stewardship was to take somebody else's property and treat it like yours. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Everything that you have, your life, everything belongs to God. Now, He's given it to you. What are you doing with it? He's given it to me. Yeah. He's given it to me because it's mine. No, but it's not yours. It's, it's His. Well, it's His. Is it an Indian giver or something? He just gives it to me and then... He gives it to you, and then he says, okay, I'm, I'm watching to see what you're going to do with it. So, okay, that's pretty scary if you ask me. The parable me. of the talents would be some yeah. example of that, you know. Well, the parable of the talents is actually going out and increasing the talents. Well, the same thing. You have, you have a message. Uh, are we just living So that self you would get something else even bigger later. Not necessarily. Well, that's what happened in the parable of the talents. What happened yeah. was they just did what they, uh, the right thing to do. Yeah. They did it because it was the right thing, not in Well, that's because of the truth. Not because but of a promise. Okay. To me, stewardship, to me, stewardship is to take some of what belongs to somebody else's and treat it as if it's yours. No, that's, that's, well, that's well but, but again, I'm saying, Corinthians, Paul says a couple times in Corinthians that your body, your mind, your soul, if you, whatever you choose to call it, it belongs to him. It doesn't belong to you. He's given it yeah. to you to use for his cause. It, we, we, we are so used to thinking, you know, it's mine. We start out when we're, as soon as we can say a few words, if we have brother or sister, it's mine, you know. Don't you take my toy out, it's mine. That's your, but, well, your point, self-centered. Yeah, and you're and that's you're, we're born that way, but the truth is that we belong to God. And everything we have, our life, our breath, last time we talked about even your heartbeats happen because God is actively making it happen. So you, it doesn't belong to you. We are going to be judged on that in the final analysis, what we have You're done. You're scaring with. me again. Well, it's You're right there. Me again. Depart from me. I, I don't, don't know. know you. I need a God that's, that's in love. Yeah. I need a God that's love. Yeah. Well, and if you're scaring point. me with all this, no, this judgment it's stuff, how you use how you <laughs> use your talents and what you've got—that's what they. The oh. well, here's what Paul says. Oh. Despite all those troubles, Paul went through. He stated clearly in Philippians, which we read a moment ago, that no matter whether he was hungry or well fed, no matter what his conditions were, he was content. Uh, he, he wasn't afraid. He was content. Are we content with our current experience? So. Myra, I think the next one is yours. No, it's me. Yeah. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, yours, yes. Contentment in every condition is a great art, a spiritual mystery. It is to be learned and to be learned as a mystery. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. It is a box of precious ointment and very comforting and useful for troubled hearts in troubled times and in conditions and in and conditions. Yeah. Okay. And what was he talking about when he talks about the box of precious ointment? Does that remind you of anything? Mary Magdalene. Mary yeah. Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, absolutely. Well, now, for people like Gary who are afraid here, we go to Romans 8.28. We know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. And God says, if you have the right kind of relationship with me, I will take care of you. Do we, do we trust him? There's a thing called faith. Hebrews 13, verse 5, 
says something similar. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. God is going to be right by us. But that doesn't mean bad things are not going to happen to you. No, 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 no. Because no. we've got, you know, the well, look, yeah. We've got the examples of uh, John the Baptist and Jesus and Paul and Peter. As, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and but Jesus. the question is, uh, were they? How did they conduct their lives? Is and uh, does it scare you, or or does it make you love the well, Creator more? And if we if we remember what Ellen White said in Desire of Ages, when Jesus was dying, the Father was right beside the cross, right beside. The, now Jesus couldn't see him. He couldn't reach out to him. He couldn't feel that he was there. He died as a, a lonely human being, but in actual fact, the Father was right there. So, and sometimes we'll have to go through some things, but, and the, those things will be things that God thinks we need, but it'll happen. But he'll never leave us nor forsake yep. us, and he'll be there. I think, Gary, mm -hmm. that most of the world is afraid of God. Mm -hmm. So... And that well, is I never the said I no was afraid no. Of him. I was just listening to the words being used yes. there, and it would scare me. And nobody can share with someone that's afraid their no fear. If I don't have fear, it's not going to help somebody else. Yeah. And God said, and God knows that. He knows that every single one of us have to have a personal relationship. He says, "Taste, see that I am who I am, what I am." So it's a very personal experience. It's a very personal experience, and God knows each one of us and what it is that fears puts fear in us, yeah. and He knows what to do with that. Well, here's a couple of passages from the Bible. Look at Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Now, that's a really hard thing for human beings to do. That verse I have written yes. down and I posted where I can see it because every time you think you know something, I go yes. back to that and I go, yes. okay, there may be something else out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to see that in a moment. Look at Isaiah 55 verse 9. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways and my thoughts above yours. Yes, Dennis, you're going to comment? Yeah, it, in Proverbs it does tell us to get knowledge and to mm -hmm. get wisdom and to get understanding, but here it says don't lean on that understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to trust mm -hmm. in God uh, because we our our understanding is going to be limited. Yes. We need to be expanding Very. our understanding about God always. Yeah. You know, I like to use the phrase I learned many years ago, and that is if we worship the same picture of God this year that we had last year, we have a graven image, we are worshiping an idol. An idol is something is a false concept of God. Mm -hmm. And if we are not expanding it, uh, I look at it that Jesus came here to demonstrate the truth about the Father. He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And uh, Jesus demonstrated, you don't, he's, he didn't advocate killing anybody. He didn't kill anybody. In fact, he suffered <laughs> the ignominious death mm -hmm. of, a, of a criminal, and he wasn't a criminal. So, mm -hmm. Well, we've got a very interesting quote that helps us with that. Myra, I think that's yeah. yours, right? Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us, mm -hmm. of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find the perplexities vanish and the plain path before their feet. From Mrs. White's Desire of Ages, page 330 and Ministry of Healing, page 481. So, mm -hmm. while we're panicking and we're afraid, because we can't figure out how we're going to make the next step, God says, just calm. Not that you don't need to be alert and, and, and be cautious, but I have a thousand ways to take care of you of which you know nothing. Okay? Do we really believe that? I do. <laughs> Good. Good for you. We should all believe that. We do. Do we ever find times in our lives when it seems like the path forward is impossible? Do we have enough faith at those times to ask God to show us the way forward? How often do our wishes and wants prevent us from going the way that God would like us to go? Now that's a, that's a tougher. 
challenge, right? You're at wards against the flesh. Yes. First Corinthians thirteen twelve. I think that's yours, Jim. What we see now is like a dim image, a yeah. dim image in the mirror. <laughs> then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then I will, excuse me. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. That's from the Good News Bible, First Corinthians thirteen twelve. So is that why we have uh, so many problems? We're always looking in dim mirrors. Yes, what is it that we see in dim mirrors? And that, I ourselves. think, should be the question. No, not just ourselves. I think the message from God yeah. that we see in dim mirrors, which keeps us from recognizing the love of God that we should duplicate in our own lives. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Well, are there any negative effects of exercising faith in God? I wonder what Paul would have said if we asked him that. He counted all loss for the sake of exactly. knowing Jesus. So as long as he knew Jesus, the rest didn't, didn't really matter. Okay, so the more we trust in God, the more faith we'll have. In fact, trust is faith. Trust is probably the best definition of faith. So when we get in a tight spot and we just can't figure out how this happened, we say, well, God, I'm leaving it up to you now. What happens? That's an opportunity for our faith to grow, not to panic, right? As we see the ways in which God can care for us, we become more and more comfortable with Him. I spent many years in working in East Africa, and I can think of several times when, you know, something crazy happened, you just, and you think, whoa, you know, and then suddenly the path just opens, and there you see, wow, you know, and you say, that had to be God's hand. How You couldn't see any way through, and then suddenly, bang, it's there. Okay, um, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. That's mine, I believe. What does it mean to trust? Let's, read, let's just read Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. That's a familiar verse. Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Okay, so what does that mean? Ellen White said in these words, when Jesus speaks of the new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, new purposes, new motives. What is the sign of a new heart? A changed life. There is a daily, hourly dying to selfishness and pride. That comes from I don't know which one of those is the most convenient spot. Maybe, anyway, it comes from the youth instructor back from September 26 of 1901. Next messages to young people, yeah. 72 might be more the easiest, most easily accessible, yeah. Well, there are times when we face difficult situations, and there are times when we face situations that seem like <clears throat> they're completely out of our control. So now I have, you this I have this question for you. Is it easier to say to God, <clears throat> I trust you when you have no idea what to do next? Or is it easier to say, well, God, I trust you, but I'd like to go this way? Well, then you're mm. trusting in yourself. You're double-minded. <laughs> <laughs> so, does God need to bring us into situations that are just completely, we have no idea what to do in order for us to trust him? There's enough out there that keeps <laughs> There's enough out there, okay. <laughs> you, you think he makes a step in the dark? Take a step into the dark? Does he do that? Well, I can tell you that there's a lot of theologians. You don't hear about it quite so much now, but about 30 years ago, it was a, it was a catchphrase for almost every theologian. Take a leap of faith. Yeah. You know, you jump it in the dark, you know. So, well, let's... We've cho we're choosing to, s to mention the lives of some people who came to really trust Jesus and what happened to them. And I think, Carrie, you have the next one there? Yes. There are lessons for us to learn from the experience of the apostles. These men were as true as steel to principle. They were men who would not fail nor be discouraged. 
They were full of reverence and zeal for God, full of noble purposes and aspirations. They were by nature as weak and helpless as any of those now engaged in the work, but they put their whole trust in the Lord. Wealth they had, but it consisted of mind and soul culture. And this every one may have who will make God first and last and best in everything. They toiled long to learn the lessons given them in the school of Christ, and they did not toil in vain. They bound themselves up with the mightiest of all powers and were ever longing for a deeper, higher, broader comprehension of eternal realities that they might, they might successfully present treasures of truth to a needy world. And that's by Ellen G. White from Gospel Workers, chapter 25 and 26. Where did Jesus find those kind of people? I'm going to read one. I Common th people. Huh? Common people. Well, listen, here's what, Jesus, here's what Ellen White says about it. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen. Now, why would he choose unlearned fishermen? Because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. What is that teaching us? It's a lot harder to unlearn something that we've come to trust in than it is to learn something new that we need to trust in. So what happened? They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man, and I would say woman too, for sure, patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his collaborators. So, common men, yes, but he, you know, Luke 6 tells us that he and his father spent the whole night discussing these, well, it doesn't say that, but I know, I'm sure that's what was going on. The night before he chose his disciples, they spent the, he spent the whole night in prayer. So he called to be his collaborators, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured, they had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 250. So, there are lessons to be learned. Who, who got that one? Did I? Uh, First Peter 2.12, is that where I'm you are? I'm sorry. Oh, we did. Th we did that. We passed yeah. it, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Around. Yeah. So there, and I'm supposed to do this next one. There are lessons for us to learn from the experience of the apostles. These men were as true as steel to principle. They were men who would not fail nor be discouraged. They were full of reverence and zeal for God, full of noble purposes and aspirations. They were by nature as weak and helpless as any of those now engaged in the work. But they put their whole trust in the Lord. Wealth they had, and I guess, Carrie, you already read this, huh? But it consisted of mind and soul culture, and this everyone may have who will make God first and last and best in everything. They toiled long to learn the lessons given by them in the school of Christ, and they did not toil in vain. They bound themselves up with the mightiest of all powers and were ever longing for a deeper, higher, broader comprehension of eternal realities that they might successfully present the, t the treasures of truth to a needy world. Gospel Workers, page 25, paragraph 1. Okay, so the next big question is we come to a conclusion on these lessons. If we are faithful followers of Jesus, if we are true Christian stewards, would anybody notice? Absolutely. Okay. Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. And I think you have a word on that one too, Fred, is that right? Uh, yes, in First Peter 2.12, your conduct among the heathen should be so good that they accuse you of being evildoers. <laughs> when, when, they <laughs> was, when they accuse you of being evildoers, they will have to recognize your good deeds and so praise God on the day of His coming. Wow. And this is from the Good News Bible. Yeah. 
Well, Christian stewardship, true Christian stewardship is on display before our families, our fellow workers, our communities, in fact, in the, and we might say our, our Sabbath school classes, our churches, in fact, the entire world and the entire universe. Sometimes we think we're just in private, but remember 1 Corinthians 4, 9, for it seems to me, this is Paul, of course, for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle, and the word spectacle, the Greek word is theatros, so from which we get theater, for the whole world of angels and of humanity. So we're, we're, the world is watching us. So what are they learning? Well, on the internet now, people think it's private because they're yeah. typing in, but, but some of the blogs Dennis has shared, little snippets, and I'm grateful he only, Spectrum and stuff, these, I can't believe these are Christians getting on there, died, I mean they're, yeah. The language, it's just ridiculously barbaric and cannibalistic. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. And that's not just spectrum, but I mean, it's yeah. all over on Facebook and oh, teenagers yeah. oh, and yes. the whole thing. And unfortunately, we have a generation of kids that are growing up thinking that's the real world. Yes. Yes. Jeff, what are they learning? Well, according to what I have here to read from uh, This Day with God, it says, Everything in nature has its appointed work and murmurs, not at its position. In spiritual things, every man and woman has his or her own peculiar sphere and vocation. The interest God requires will be proportionate to the amount of in entrusted capital according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now is your time and privilege to show a stability of character that will make you of real moral worth. Christ has a right to your service. Yield to him heartily. Yeah. That was actually from a private letter she wrote to a very close friend. This, I, I tried to look this up and see what was in the asterisks there and all that kind of stuff. It's not, all you have is this. Whatever is in the asterisk is not available. I could probably find it maybe at the White Estate, but I couldn't look any more than this. She had a sister by the name of Mary as well, a real sister. So I don't know this is her, whether it's a real sister or whether it's just a Christian sister. How old was she when she wrote that? It's in 1875. 1875, she would have been 58. I believe if I'm not my math is not wrong 1827 to 75 I believe that's correct yeah what would Jesus do if he had your job Gary that's a good one for you <laughs> what would Jesus do if he had your job yeah my job yeah well that's something that you're always trying to find out <laughs> Well, that's, yes. that's, that's a fair yes. comment, yeah. Yeah. Because I sure can't answer it just mm. right off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, we all believe that our ultimate destination is one place, right? We're all hoping to be in heaven. And the faithful followers of God in that blessed chapter in Hebrews 11, it says this, It was in faith that all these people died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off, they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. And, and of course, it's not a country that's here. It's a country that's, that's there. So, and you think about some of the people, I mean, going back to the Old Testament, what would you do if you were a very, very wealthy person living in a very comfortable city with a family and everybody around you and God says, I want you to go to a place where you'll never have a home. You have to keep moving. It'll, you know, there'll never be a place for you to settle down. Um, and he was 75 at that point when God said move. But didn't he say that he was going to be with him? Yeah, sure. Would you like to live in a tent for the rest of your life? So when you're, you're, 
your beloved is going to move. Yeah, that's You cool. want to be with your beloved. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So did he have a choice? I don't think so, because well, God was his beloved. Yeah, in that sense, you're, you're right. Yeah. I don't think God forced him. I'm sure he didn't no, force him, but... No, but... You know. He said, we're moving. <laughs> right? <laughs> but before that day comes, before we get to see that heavenly kingdom that we're looking for, there must be a judgment. God can only admit to heaven those who will not restart the great controversy in heaven. God can, in quotation marks, only save those who are safe to, s to live next door to for the rest of eternity. Does that include us? Honestly now, what would you expect to, for Jesus to say at your appearing? And Gary, I think those next two quotes are from you, or Matthew for you, for you. 25, 21. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share, share my happiness. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. And we have Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do my Father's will in heaven do what want, my Father do, heaven, wants them to do. do. Yeah, wants them to do. When uh, Judgment Day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name, we spoke God's message. By your name, we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. That's from the Good News Bible also. When I read that, I, I smile to myself, and the, as, at least in my experience, the more Bible stuff and the more Spirit of Prophecy stuff that you read, the more you think, oh, each thing you read it reminds you of something else that happened. I think about those, the seven sons of Sceva that Paul was a, <laughs> came up against in, there in Ephesus. And this, this, they got, got this crazy man, they were going to cast the devil out of him, and he beat up all seven of them, and he said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? <laughs> you know, they, they were trying to cast them, casting out the demons in the name of Jesus. Who are you? <laughs> so, we know that there is nothing that we can do on our own that will adequately prepare us for entrance into heaven. We need a constant relationship, and that relationship is called faith with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit because they are the only ones able to transform us to become truly Christ-like. Are we ready for that? Are we giving to God our time, our talents, our money, and our influence, what we, what we should be giving? Well, um, it's, mine. it's yours. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks. When Christ followers give back to the Lord his own, they are accumulating treasure which will be given to them when they hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Matthew 25, 23. And also on Desire of Ages, yeah. page 523. Well, I think anybody who's been around a Christian church very long has heard about the two great commandments. Jesus said the two great commandments are love God with all your heart, and love your fellow human beings, right? Are we doing that? How would you go about, you can't, we're not, we're not given the job of judging anyone else, so judge yourself. How, how would you go about measuring yourself to see whether you are fulfilling that criteria? I think there's a danger in trying to quantify this. Mm -hmm. Simply because we're real good at mathematics and making lists and relationship stuff with God is there's there's a big difference to me mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure that you can quantify it by how much you know 
because um, the people that got brought to the work at the very last hour of the day got the same quarter mm -hmm. as the people that worked all day. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we can be the judge of it because if I start looking at myself, honey, I am way off base. I got, I really, I really can't be looking at myself. Uh, can you imagine what would happen if someone did that to a labor force today and paid oh the people yeah. who work one hour? I yeah. mean, there would Wouldn't be such an be? uprising that, mm -hmm. whew. Yep. I have to say in response to that, when I read it, I took a little different look at it. And I looked and I thought, you know, pictures at, in the holidays, you have pictures. And we went back and looked at a bunch of them. And Gordon looked at one and he pointed out, he goes, who is that lady there? And of course it was me. <laughs> and he goes, that stern looking. Oh. And I did. And I know, I know there are times when I'm so focused on what I'm doing that yeah. I'll walk into the grocery store, I'll walk into whatever. And I mean, today I went into the store and somebody, it took me, I don't know how long this man was looking at me smiling mm -hmm. before I finally went, oh yeah, I'm supposed to smile back. Mm. You know, so there are times when you, you do need to Yes, okay, yes, light yes, back and yes. It, remember that you're not the only one here. <laughs> Jim, are you, you have our next quotation there. Oh. <laughs> Christ came to this world. Christ came to this world to reveal the love of God. His followers are to continue the work which he began. Let us strive to help and strengthen one another. Seeking the good of others is the way to true, excuse me, way in which true happiness can be found. Man does not work against his own interest by loving God and his fellow man. The more selfish is his spirit, unselfish. the more unselfish his spirit, the happier he is because he is fulfilling God's purpose. Signs of the Times, December 25, 1901. Okay, very good. Well, Ellen White has a statement which is basically not quoted anywhere precisely. The little pieces of it are snippets or which somewhere else. But that just, just bowls me over every time I read it. And it's, she was talking about the conditions of things when Jesus came to this earth. I mean, he came as this helpless baby boy, and he came to a world that was absolutely unprepared for his arrival. This is, what, this is the words that she, she uses. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. Think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So that's the great controversy right there. See, Satan wants us to believe that God is like he really is. He doesn't want us to see him as he really is. Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to cor and women too, of course, to uh, correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right. Now, set right means to be justified. Keep right needs to be sanctified. The only way he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth. I'm going to stop there for a second. And we're just going to ask you out there and everybody here to think for a moment. How many different explanations have you heard about why Jesus came? What does Ellen White say? His whole purpose here was to represent the Father. Now, if he if he hadn't of, well, you say we weren't prepared for him to come. Isn't that the reason why he came is because we're not prepared? Well, I mean, he needs to, he needs to teach us something. He needs well, to teach he, us about the Father. Yeah, How would we be prepared unless yeah. somebody had come down to teach us? Well, they had the entire Old Testament 
Uh, I don't think there was enough to do that. They had the whole testament, then why why was it necessary? If if the message from the Old Testament oh, yeah. was, well, was that's pure, that's then that's why did he need to come? Apparently it wasn't pure. And all he, his job was to, to clarify. Yeah. And then Philip, Philip asked him, show us the Father. Yeah. Well, you've been, I've been with you all this time. Uh, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Oh. I mean, that's... Uh, oh, I get it. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... Uh, now, just a minute. It, it, we recognize that in the future, Jesus is not going to kill anybody. People determine, they make their choice as to whether God's going to, or that whether they're going to be saved. They choose to vote in God's favor or against him. That's mm -hmm. the way it works. God doesn't have to keep anybody out. Mm -hmm. People just self-determine where they're going. Yeah. But he hasn't all basically always been that way. He's a protector, but some people, yeah. you, well, you go through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. That's mm -hmm. what, Psalms 23rd, mm -hmm. 23rd Psalm. Uh, bad things happen and it is just left to run. It was God doing that. We read all through the Old Testament. Uh, God killed him. God killed him. I'm going to bring the Babylonians on you. All that stuff. We're, we're doing the people a disservice by not teaching them how to read the Bible. Yeah. Well, Jesus came to set men, I continue reading, to set men right through the revelation of God. And Christ was arrayed before men, the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, guess what? The revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Wow. So, um, Gary, I think I gave you the next one. Is that correct? Yeah. <clears throat> there is also a constant interchange, taking and giving out, receiving and returning to the Lord his own. To every true believer, God imparts light and blessing. And this the believer imparts to others in the work that he does for the Lord. As he gives of that which he receives, his capacity for receiving is increased. Room is made for fresh supplies of grace and truth. Clear light, increased knowledge, uh, hears. On this giving and receiving depend the life and growth of the church. He who receives but never gives soon ceases to receive. If the truth does not flow from him to others, he loses his capacity to receive. We must impart the goods of heaven if we would receive fresh blessing. Wow. That's by Ellen G. White for a review on Hells, December 24, 1903. And it's also found in Councils on Stewardship, page 36, paragraph 1. So are we, are we, do we really believe those words? Are we taking advantage of that? Do we recognize it? I mean, Jim a little while ago told us about people whose picture of God hasn't changed in the last year, and they're like worshiping an idol. So maybe this is what the problem is. If you're not sharing what God has given you, if you're not sharing what you have learned, then pretty soon you become a dried up stream, right? Then an un, or unfaithful servant, if you yeah. sit and tell him the falsehoods about God. So in our questions, our final questions to you out there, how much influence does God have in your life? Does the road in front of you seem extremely difficult? Does God help you over the rough spots? It has been said that one person plus God is a majority. If we had God on our side, do we have anything to worry about? Well, there's the famous quotation from Abraham Lincoln, which has been modified somewhat for a popular song. Abraham Lincoln was once quoted as saying, my concern, remember he's in the middle of a civil war, my concern is not whether God is on our side, because someone was asking him, you know, here's the North versus the South. Who do you think, whose side is God on? He says, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about you out there? Could you write in a few words what you've learned about stewardship from this series of lessons? That would be a great practice. Could you explain why it's important 
to be a steward in, in life of a Christian. A little while ago, we read from Matthew 7, talking about the people that God says, go away, I never knew you. How could God say that to anybody? Especially people who would, who would claim they had cast out demons and performed miracles. And I, I always, when, I, when I read that, I think, of, I think of Judas. When God, when Jesus, who of course was God, first sent out his disciples on their first missionary journey, he said, cleanse the leopard, raise the dead. Did Judas ever raise someone from the dead? Mm -hmm. that's, what they were, that's what they were told to do. Well, are these people who are, who are, who are claiming all these things, are they just self-deceived? Well, usually we think about stewardship in, in individual terms. Okay, I'm going to be a good steward, I'm going to pay my tithe, I'm going to pay my offerings, I'm going to try to represent God correctly. But could stewardship be for a Sabbath school class or a whole local church? Should it be? And Gary's question earlier, how is stewardship related to witnessing? Does one need to be a good steward before one can witness correctly? Try to, try to imagine how you would feel on that great resurrection morning to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Can you imagine anything better than that? We've learned a lot of things about stewardship, about the way of caring for our means and how to be honest in dealing with God's things and so forth. And sometimes we, we do a fairly good job of that and sometimes we don't do such a good job. Sometimes we think our ideas are better than God's. Would you agree that stewardship is all about our relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, if it's a matter of following Jesus Christ, that would be true good Christian stewardship, I would think. Do you find it difficult to talk about Christianity to others in your community? Are you a silent witness? Well, I hope, let's hope that you're at least a witness. What can we do to make our churches more, seem more attractive to those around us? Be better stewards. Be better examples of Jesus. He liked Jesus. I mean, think about how he was attracted talked to everybody. It's your turn now. Our loving Father in heaven, we have come through some challenging lessons here. We have thought about what it means to be a true Christian servant, a steward. We thought, we thought about what it, what it might be to be like you. Only if we could do that very faithfully, we know that your coming would be brought very soon. We look for that day. May it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.